We're back from the, we're back from break. Rick from uh, Rick Ward from Orbit's Edge there in Titusville, Florida. In our last segment, I wrote this note because when you have photos of what changes images, and you can ask either your lowercase AI what changed, you're finding what you're not looking for while you're not looking for it. That's how I translated that out. I was like, no, that's it. That's it. I mean, if you want to go back to Don Rumsfeld talking about your unknown unknowns, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, the way satellite imagery works today is the satellite is incredibly dumb. I tell it grid one, two, three, four, five, six, and it takes that picture. There might be dancing element elephants in one, two, three, four, five, seven, but you're never going to know about it because you did not tell it to take that picture with this. With this capability, it doesn't know that they're dancing elephants, but it knows that they weren't there the last time it passed by. Mm. So it would capture that. So, so yeah. It's, I love that. it. Finding, finding what you're not looking for while you're not looking for it. Because in my head, as, as we were having this conversation, I'm immediately thinking, what are the implications for climate change? What, if, what can I find while I'm not looking for it? Because you gave an example of you can narrow it down to just a single bush in your garden or cars in a parking lot. So in my head, it's where was the iceberg? Where was the ice shelf? Where was the river? Where were the grasslands? Where are they at now? So I see a lot of applications for this. But because we, exactly. are, but because we are the space economy, and when you solve for space, you 100% solve for Earth, courtesy of Dr. C.N. Proctor, she says it's a lot. Let's talk about what this computing power means when we go to the moon uh, as part of the Artemis program. George, what's, what's, what's a good question we can ask Rick about that? Do we have the same types of issues or might we face similar issues on limitations of how much data we can send back and forth when we're talking about long-term moon habs and permanent moon, um, you know, establishments of, of a presence there? Or is it only because it's satellites and this is a use case just for satellites or does edge compute have a place on the moon? So if by the same, you mean a hundred times worse then I would agree with you. <laughs> uh, and the moon is the best case scenario out of, out of Earth orbit. So you have a 1.2 second time lag for communications to go from the earth to the moon and back which means if I am- Oh, it's like my Zoom remote, calls. It's like my Zoom yeah. calls back in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you're getting all the answers to the questions one staggered from the original question. So yeah, so if I'm operating a rover um, on the moon and I'm using teleoperation, I need to move a little bit wait for it to get the command, execute the command, take a picture, send the picture back to me, mean look at it, and decide which direction I want to move a little bit more. And that's how you ended up with uh, Curiosity rovers uh, on Mars, which is not the moon, that traveled hundreds of meters over five years because they have to wait for that whole decision loop and, and transmit loop, except in that scenario, it's like 40 minutes to um, well over an hour, depending on where the relative locations of the planets are in, in their respective orbits. So on the moon, if you're going to have something like resource extraction, where you're, you're trying to mine water, or you're trying to mine some other resource, you need to be producing hundreds or thousands of kilograms per day. That needs to be your processing rate. In order to do that, you need to be moving kilometers per day. And you can't do that without on-site compute. It needs to go from all those same processes I just described. They need to happen except with meters or, or centimeters of distance instead of hundreds of thousands of kilometers of distance. I love it. I, I'm thinking of there's some sci-fi nerd out there right now who's saying there's a quantum entanglement solution for that. But before we get to that, get to that moment, 
I know that Orbit's Edge is always on the cutting edge of computing, not only in low Earth orbit or near Earth orbit or Earth orbit, but also for as we head off further into space. So as we wrap up here on the space economy, George, I'm gonna give you the final question or our shout out. So the floor is yours. Sure, Rick. I know something that we talked about uh, before we jumped on here, which is this also has applications for terrestrial uses, because if you can make it work 100 miles plus up, you can make it work down here. Tell us a little bit more about that before we go. So funny story. Um, part of our prototyping process involves basically doing the same thing, but for here. Um, we have to solve thermal management. We have to so solve radiation. We have to solve power, power management and generation. And in order to do that in sort of a scaled way, we said, what if we built a closed air uh, climate controlled environment that does that handle thermal management? It can handle uh, satellite, uh, it can handle solar power generation, battery power backup and make that as a self-contained zero infrastructure compute platform. And that's, that brought us back to some of the early conversations we'd had with some of the oil and gas folks and some of the other resource extraction folks where they are doing data generation at the edge and they have basically nothing in the way of infrastructure to support that. And they have to process it. They have to compute it. And what, they, what these guys have told us is every time your computer goes down, it's going to take you like five hours to get it back up because some guy has to get out of bed at 3 a.m. because it never goes out during business hours and drive down this freaking dirt path to get to where it go to get to where the thing is and even if all he has to do is like 15 minutes of work to get it working again it's still going to take five hours and 15 minutes because that's how long it takes him to get there take the so, cartridge out blow on the cartridge put it back in yeah yeah it, it, all computers work exactly like your super nest did yep. so yep. that's that that's something everybody doesn't know um but yeah so that's that's basically what we're wanting to address from a ground side application, uh, either much better uptime, much better reliability than what, what they're used to, uh, much better longevity for the actual computer systems. Because some of these things, depending on the GPUs you throw in there, we're, we're pushing over 100K for one unit. Uh, you can easily hit into 200K if you, if you need the up-to-date, up-to-minute GPUs especially with the GPU market the way it is this year. Excellent. I love it. I'm not, I'm not going to get into it here, but I, I also have a feeling that that could be useful for crypto mining since we have so much crypto mining that's fleeing uh, China and the Himalayas at this time. But we'll, we'll save that, that for a different, yeah, we might save that for a different segment or maybe just offline for our own profits. So um, I appreciate it. The questions and your time left today, Rick. Um, Samson, let's just sign us out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining in. Uh, follow Rick there at Orbit's Edge, orbitsedge.com. And remember, if you want, if you want to find what you're not looking for while you're not looking for it from space, contact Orbit's Edge. So that's it. See you beautiful people in the next orbit. Bye-bye.